Welcome to the first lecture. In this lecture, we're going to get an introduction to software architecture and also learn why software architecture is so important. After that, we will define more formally and explain what software architecture means for us in the context of this course. And finally, we will discuss where software architecture fits in the overall picture of the software development cycle. So let's start with some analogies from outside the software world, which will give us a good intuition of what software architecture means to us. Everything we build has a structure, whether we know about it or not, and whether we thought about it ahead of time or arrived at it spontaneously. The more we invest in building a product, the harder it becomes to change its structure after the fact. But what is the importance of a structure, and why would we want to change it at all in the future? Well, the thing is, the structure of our system describes both the intent of our product and its qualities. For example, if we look at the architecture of a theater, we see that its intent is to have shows and performances. But if we make people live or work in a theater instead of in a suitable house or an office, they would find themselves very uncomfortable and would have a terrible experience. On the other hand, if we look at the architecture of a residential home, we see that it would be perfect for people to live there, but hosting big shows or performances would not work very well. Now, when it comes to software, the same principles apply. There is almost an infinite number of ways for us to organize our code to achieve the functionality of the system, but different organizations will give us different properties. In other words, the software architecture impacts how our product will perform and scale, how easy it will be for us to add new features and grow our engineering team, and also how well it's going to respond to failures or security attacks. And similarly to physical structures, if we organize our software in a suboptimal way, the cost of a redesign will be significant, both in terms of time and money, especially so when we're working on a large-scale system. So now that we have some basic intuition and motivation for software architecture, let's define it a bit more formally so we know exactly what we're talking about when we use this term. Now, there are many ways to define software architecture, and for many years people have been arguing about the best way to define it. So in our course, the definition we're going to use is as follows. The software architecture of a system is a high-level description of the system structure, its different components, and how those components communicate with each other to fulfill the system's requirements and constraints. It's a heavily loaded definition, so let's unpack it piece by piece. The first part of the definition states that the software architecture is a high-level description of the system. It means that it's an abstraction that shows us the important components that help us reason about the system, while hiding the implementation details out of the view. This implies that things like technologies or programming languages we use to implement the system are not part of the software architecture and are part of the implementation instead. This is an important point because many engineers falsely assume that software architecture is just about picking the right technologies or frameworks. This could not be farther from the truth. And in fact, we want to delay making these choices until the very end of our design. The second part of the definition talks about the different components and how they communicate with each other. The components that we're talking about when we talk about software architecture are black box elements that are defined by their behavior and APIs. As a matter of fact, those components may themselves be complex systems that are described through their own software architectural diagrams. So in a sense, this definition may be recursive when needed. Finally, the last part of the definition talks about fulfilling the system's requirements and constraints. 
which means that the software architecture should describe how all those components are coming together to do what the system must do, which is basically our requirements, and how the system does not do what it shouldn't do, which is described in the system constraints. We're going to talk about all those components in great detail throughout the course, but I think having this definition up front is going to set the stage for what we're going to learn in the following lectures. Now, when it comes to software development, we can talk about software architecture on many different levels of abstraction. Starting from the lowest level abstractions, like different classes or structs, depending on the programming language, and the organization and communication between objects inside a program. We can also go one level up and talk about modules, packages, or libraries, and how they interact with each other. But since in this course we're going to be focusing on large-scale systems, we're going to talk about a higher level abstraction, where the individual components are separate services that run as individual processes or groups of processes, potentially on different computers. It turns out that taking this more distributed multi-service approach allows us to architect systems that can handle large amounts of requests, process and store very large amounts of data, and serve thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of users every day. A few examples of such systems include online software services such as ride-sharing, video-on-demand, social media, online video games, investing services and banks, and many, many others. When we set our goal to build a product that operates on such a scale, getting the architecture just right can mean going from a small startup to a multi-billion dollar company and making a positive impact on millions of people all around the world. On the flip side, if we don't do a good job at the design phase, we can potentially waste months of engineering time building a system that doesn't meet our requirements and that nobody wants to use. And restructuring a system that was not architected correctly is very hard and expensive. So, as we can see, the stakes here are high, which makes what we're going to learn in this course super important. Now, before we conclude this lecture, I want to talk about one last thing, which is the place where software architecture fits in the overall picture. Software development can roughly be described in four phases. Design, implementation, testing, and deployment. Since generally, software products keep evolving over a long period of time, those four phases can be repeated many times where arguably the first iteration is the most critical, and subsequent iterations make incremental changes to the existing system. Now, something that I already alluded to, but didn't state formally, is that software architecture is the output of the design phase and the input to the implementation phase. In this course, we're going to focus on arguably the most important step, which is the design phase. The design phase is essentially a process of defining the software architecture of the system that an entire team or even multiple teams of engineers later proceed to implement, sometimes over a course of multiple weeks or months. Now, there are many challenges of defining a good software architecture for our system, but the biggest challenge that software engineers struggle with the most is the fact that unlike an algorithm or a formula that can be proven to be both correct and optimal, we can't do the same for software architecture. So to guarantee our success, what we can do is follow a methodical design process as well as apply industry-proven architectural patterns and best practices, which is what we're going to learn throughout the course. But before we proceed to the first topic, let's quickly summarize what we learned in this lecture. In this lecture, we got the intuition and motivation for software architecture. We learned that every software system has an architecture, which is basically its structure, and its structure is absolutely critical for its success. 
We later define software architecture more formally as a high-level description of the system structure, its different components, and how those components communicate with each other to fulfill the system's requirements and constraints. And we concluded with placing software architecture in the overall software development cycle as the output of the design phase and the input to our system's implementation. So now that we got a solid introduction to what we're going to learn, let's go ahead and start learning the first topic of the course.